Sorry about that. Um, I'm not going to stop and start over. <laughs> so, um, let, uh, or at least I'm not going to stop this video and start over. You just have to have silence for a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so Robert Smith asked me this question about uh, testing Redux um, in isolation. And uh, so he created this demo app um, that shows testing Redux, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, his opinion is that uh, selectors and actions and, and the whole Redux, um, the fact that you're using Redux is an implementation detail that the user doesn't care about. And that's mostly true, like for 99% of the time, 99.999% uh, of the time, that is true. Um, except for if you're like hyperterm or something that exposes the capability of you having uh, Redux um, so people can plug in their own middleware or something to add plugins. Um, then in that case, that's not true. But for most use cases for Redux, that is totally true. Redux is an implementation detail. You're not exposing that to the user. Uh, so the assertion is, shouldn't uh, you te your test be isolated as much as possible from this implementation detail? It would make um, moving away from Redux to like React Apollo or Link State or whatever um, much more straightforward because you're not testing that implementation detail. So um, Robert also concedes that implementing TDD um, can help you write those functions. And so that's definitely true. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, uh, so I am mostly in agreement with Robert here. Um, I, I think that there are definitely some cases where um, it's a little bit overkill to test, uh, like uh, test a component that uses all the, um, the actions that your, um, your Redux uh, reducers can handle. Um, there are situations where um, there are like a million edge cases and stuff and you have this error component that's just going to display the error or something. You don't have to render that error component with all these edge cases. Maybe it'd be a little easier to just do one and then um, uh, that way and then have a uh, test for each of those other cases. It really kind of depends, but most of the time I would, I would uh, say I'm on board with, uh, with Robert here. So here's what he does um, in, with, with React Testing Library and using React Redux. So um, I, I think the crux of this whole thing is uh, for this to work properly, um, your store has to be exposed in a specific way. And it's actually pretty easy. Um, you ex export a function that gets you um, the, the, that calls create store. And so you can pass it some initial state and then you do your create store thing. Um, and so the, the store that he's exporting here is actually a function that will give you the store. Uh, and if you do that uh, for your pr uh, project, then um, testing things in this way is actually pretty uh, straightforward. So uh, what he's doing here is uh, he has this function called render component and that renders the products and that's the unit under test is the, where is that products? There it is. Uh, so that's the unit that he's trying to test and he renders that within a provider that's coming from uh, React Redux. Um, so yeah, this is exactly what I recommend people do. Um, you um, render your uh, the thing that's connected to stuff or has children that's connected to stuff within that provider, and that'll give you uh, much better. Uh, like you don't have to mock as much uh, as many things, and and it gives you a much um, uh, much more confidence that the products is integrate integrating with the store properly. Um, and so then from there, he does a bunch of really neat, fun React testing library queries and stuff like that, uh, which you can take a look at and enjoy at your own, um, at your leisure. Um, so yeah, a couple other notes about this. So one, one criticism that I hear about this approach a lot of the time is, let's say that this breaks right here. How do you know what is broken? Is this the component that's broken? Is this an action creator that's broken? Is this a... A reducer that's broken? Is it a selector that's broken? There are a bunch of things that could lead to one of these assertions failing. And um, when you're doing just like a component test or an action test or a reducer test, um, then you know exactly which one of those things is broken. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a criticism that I hear. It's a lot easier to find out what's broken when you kind of isolate your units a little bit. This is part of the reason why we don't just do all of our tests as end-to-end -end tests and and like click around just like the user would. It's so one of the reasons is because it's it's harder to identify um, like what actually is causing the breakage. Uh, and so I, I think there's a good balance here, but um, 
like in my mind this is like i i never um take that criticism too seriously because um when something breaks i'm gonna know that um the product is broken in some way we have really good debugging tools to identify what that uh what is broken about that and uh, the alternative is you just make a bunch of unit tests for like each one of these uh, aspects in isolation and they're all working together they're all working in isolation fine but you have nothing to verify that they're working in concert um, okay and so you'd have to have a, an integration test for that anyway um, and I, I find that testing things this way requires you to mock a lot less uh, and and also gives you that extra confidence in, in addition um, you uh, um, oh, what's yeah you generally have to have fewer tests um, because they're like you're you're covering a lot more like if we wanted to cover all of the action creators and reducers and stuff there'd be a lot more tests um, um but uh yeah with the way that it this is written there are just like a handful of tests to cover a lot of stuff so that and and like i said that's not always a good thing but most of the time i think um i think it's a good thing so that is that um there's also the in the react testing library examples we have an example of using react redux we do this exact same thing um if i hide this thing and hide this thing um we have our well so in, in this one we do everything within a single file so here's our component um and then that component is connected and now we have that connected counter and then in our app we have our reducer and then yeah and then you'd have like a where you're actually rendering uh, with the store right um, and so then i have this render with redux that's kind of like his render component that he had there um, and here i take this initial state and then a store which can be overridden but here we're uh, initializing the store to create store uh, with my reducer in my initial state um, for in his case he just had a function that he called to get the store and he could pass the initial state that's probably a little bit better of an approach i think so um, yeah go for that but uh, yeah then we render the provider with that store and whatever other ui that you want to give us and so i think every application that uses uh, react router and redux and things should have methods like this i i have a render with providers and that's like all the providers that i use that are like globally used in my application uh, and then i can specify um, like overrides for some of those things here as an option and then here we're returning the store so you can make assertions on the store state if you want to generally avoid that but sometimes sometimes that can be useful uh, and then instead of using the render, you use render with Redux. And I've got another dev tip uh, a couple weeks ago where I show you how to create a, um, a test utilities file. And this is where I'd put this function is in that test utilities file. And you can import that all over your, your code base and use that everywhere. So that's that. Let me address any questions. Sorry about the audio at the beginning. Um, somebody asked me if I'm still working for PayPal. I totally am. Uh, I'm going to send them this video when I'm done and um, hopefully some of them find this useful um, any advice on combining and composing selectors together um, honestly i don't use react a whole lot or, or sorry <laughs> i use react all the time i don't use redux a whole lot i tried to avoid it um, because most of the time i don't need it and i've got more thoughts about that application state application state management i've got a blog uh, blog post about that you can go read up um, here i can paste that right in here for you um yeah so i this is why i don't use redux uh, a whole lot i tried to kind of avoid it um so yeah i don't have a whole lot of advice about composing selectors together but i can tell you that um taking like um i've seen a lot of um things where functions are composed together in really fancy nice ways um and like, like with recompose for example uh, lots of those helpers used on react components and i found that code to be nothing but hard to understand so uh, generally i try to avoid that i find that to be a uh, premature abstraction that makes it deleting code harder um, that's something we want to optimize for is deleting code okay so then rook is asking is night owl and take mono inside code sandbox what yes yes it is if you go to preferences in appearance then um, you have your editor theme night owl is supported by default there's a couple others here too and then you can actually 
uh, follow these instruct instructions and take your own VS Code theme and paste it right into here, which is pretty wild. Cool. Uh, in addition, the font family, Dink Mono. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure whether you have to have Dink Mono installed on your machine for this to work. So you can, you can go, go look at that. But anyway, um, yeah, Dink Mono. It's pretty great. I like Dink Mono a lot. Um, so this is actually what my editor looks like um, locally. Okay, cool. I hope that's uh, helpful to you, and I will see you all around. Thank you for the question, Robert. Yeah. See ya.